so in this seminar, I'm going to show you uh, a few uh, data about a couple of projects that I've been doing in, um, during my postdoc at the, at the Institute of Bioengineering at the PFL in Switzerland, uh, where I, sorry, Okay, where I really focus mainly on studying the liver physiology. And in particular, the focus of my research uh, was on uh, studying uh, three main topics, uh, the study of metabolism, and in particular, we uh, studied uh, how uh, metabolites uh, uh, act as signaling molecules, uh, but we also made some work on stem cell uh, physiology, and in particular, in the uh, enterohepatic system, so in the uh, liver and uh, intestine, intestinal axis. And finally, uh, I also uh, uh, designed some uh, uh, tissue engineering uh, technique, uh, and I will, give, I will show you an example of, uh, of this work and uh, how we design uh, a system to generate generate liver uh, organoids that are suitable for clinical trials. Uh, so in the, in the first slide, uh, I'm gonna um, show you um, uh, just, a few, I'm gonna say a few words about the, uh, our favorite tissue, which is the, the hepatic tissue, the liver. As you know, the liver is the most, uh, is the biggest organ in our, our body. It receives uh, the blood uh, from uh, uh, from different uh, organs such as the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, and the and the uh, intestine. And basically, it acts as a filter. And so, it receives the blood. It, uh, the blood is filtered and then is sent to uh, the systemic circulation through the hepatic veins. And the, the liver has three main functions. Uh, first of all, it is a critical hub for metabolic anesthesis. So you, you know that the, that the liver is, is the, the metabolic organ in our body. It is also important for the, the, the detoxification of uh, many molecules, for example, uh, toxins and drugs in the blood. And finally, it is a key uh, organ for the synthesis and storage of uh, biomolecules for example, cholesterol and glycogen. And the, at the anatomic level, the, the liver is composed by this uh, functional uh, unit called hepatic lobules. And uh, uh, each lobule is composed by a central vein here. And this is surrounded by what we call the portal tribe. In this of these elements, you can find a bile duct and a, part, a central um, portal vein and the, the hepatic artery. And the blood goes from the portal vein to the central vein uh, through the sinusoids. And along the sinusoids, you can find the, 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 the parenchymal cells that are the hepatocytes. And this is an example of, uh, uh, of uh, hepatic lobule in a real immunohistochemistry. So here you see the central vein and the um, uh, portal regions here. Uh, however, the liver is not only a, a filter, uh, it is a real gland uh, with exocrine and uh, exocrine and endocrine functions. And just to name a few of these functions uh, about the exocrine role of the, um, of the, uh, of the liver, uh, we find the, 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 the synthesis and secretion of bile acids, and this is critical for uh, 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 digestion and for the uh, uh, nutrient uptake. But uh, the liver has also uh, endocrine functions, and here, for example, the uh, biosynthesis and secretion of uh, different hormones, for example, insulin, ligo factor, and many others, uh, um, is a key, a key role of the, of the liver, but also the liver contributes to the activation of, of vitamins and it metabolizes different hormones by activating or inactivating uh, them. And finally, the liver is critical for secretion of uh, uh, signaling molecules such as cytokines that control the immune defense. And in my... In in our laboratory, we uh, were uh, we got interested in on the exocrine uh, activity of the liver, in particular in uh, the, the role of the liver in, uh, in the synthesis and secretion of bile acids. And bile acids uh, are metabolites that derive from the cholesterol. You see that the, the basic structure is the, the cholesterol bomb, and uh, they are synthesized into the hepatocytes and then they are stored in the gallbladder. And after food intake, the, 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 the gallbladder get contracted and the bile acids are secreted directly into the intestinal lumen, into the duodenum, where they act as a natural detergent to facilitate the absorption of the hydrophobic uh, lipids. 
Um, however, uh, bile acid uh, are not only localized into the, into the liver and the intestine, and indeed you can find uh, bile acid also at the systemic level in, uh, in the in the uh, plasma, and this is particularly true after uh, uh, after food intake. For example, if you look at this graph, you see that these three uh, bile acid are among the most abundant metabolites in the plasma after glucose challenge, uh, already after thirty minutes. And the fact that you can find bile acid uh, at the systemic level uh, suggested immediately that. Probably the uh, bile acids are not only important in the gut for uh, food uh, uptake, but they could be also important at the, at the systemic level as a signaling molecules. And the proof, the proof that this uh, hypothesis was true uh, came when uh, T -GF, the receptor TGR5 was discovered as the endogenous uh, receptor for bile acids. Uh, this receptor is also known as GP bar one, G protein bile acid acid receptor one, and it is a plasma membrane GPCR, uh, which is activated by a bile acid, in particular by secondary bile acids. And the activation of this receptor by bile acids uh, activates the canonical cell response associated with, uh, with G-alpha stimulatory proteins. So the, the, uh, our cells in our body are able to, to sense and to respond to uh, uh, bile acids through this uh, receptor. And TGR5 has been found to be expressed in many different tissues, uh, for example, in the brain, in the adipose tissue, and also in the uh, immune cells, for example, in the macrophages. And in all these um, uh, tissues, activation of TGR5 by bile acids is associated with uh, a phenol uh, with um, the reduction of uh, different metabolic syndrome phenotypes such as obesity, uh, and glucose in intolerance, and also inflammation. And TGR5 is also expressed in the uh, in, uh, intestinal uh, epithelium. However, uh, in, this, uh, in this tissue, uh, the, the role of TGR5 is pretty unknown. And so we decided to focus our attention on this uh, tissue because this is the first target of bile acid after uh, uh, food intake. So as I told you before, they are secreted and immediately released into the into the duodenum. And the intestinal uh, epithelium is, a, is the largest barrier of our body. And it has a very peculiar uh, structure. You see here, it is composed by crypts and, and villi. And this is a very dynamic uh, tissue. It regenerates uh, 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 completely every five days. Yes. So every, every week, uh, the, the intestinal epithelium of, of our intestine is completely um, is completely renewed. And this, this regeneration, as well as the, the, the patterning to the all the differentiated cells of the gut is controlled by these small cells that localize at the, at the base of the crypt and that are able to self-renew, but also to uh, give rise to all the different cells of the epithelium. And so we hypothesize that in particular in the postprandial period after uh, food ingestion, uh, the, the intestinal lumen and so the intestinal epithelial cells are exposed to high levels of bile acid coming from the gallbladder. And so we hypothesize that uh, the, the, the increase in bile acid level in this uh, tissue may control the homeostasis of this epithelium by acting through TGR5, in particular uh, uh, on, uh, at the level of stem cells. And uh, to try to address this uh, question, we decide, first of all, to use the organoid, the intestinal organoid assay. And, um, and indeed, it, it is possible to isolate crypts from, uh, for example, uh, the um, mouse intestine. And if you put this crypt in, uh, in vitro, embedded in matrigel, so in a, in, a, uh, in a ECM mimetic, and by providing specific specific growth factor, for example, uh, spawning and wind, uh, these stem cells that are uh, present in the crypts get activated and they are able in vitro to, uh, to uh, recapitulate the morphogenesis, the intestinal morphogenesis in vitro, and they uh, create these uh, nice structures called organoids that are composed by crypts 
here with the stem cells, villi, and they also have a, an internal lumen. So basically you can use the org, uh, stem cell of the, for, uh, of the intestine to generate this uh, small intestine. And the generation of these uh, organoids is a, a typical function of the, stem, of the stem cells. And so to address our question, we generate, we isolate creeps from the mice and we generated organoids uh, uh, in, um, treating the, the creep with bacon or with, uh, um, with uh, uh, um, physiological concentration of bile acid. In particular, we use uh, LCA, nitrocholic acid, which is the most potent TGL5 agonist. And as you can see here, we, what we observed after a few days in culture was that uh, at a physiological level, bile acid induced an increase in the organoid sites and in the number of creeps that are, were present in each uh, uh, organoid. And these are typical features and functions of stem cells. On the other side, a, a toxic uh, uh, concentration of bile acid, we observed this, uh, the, the opposite uh, effect. And this was pretty expected as bile acid at high level, uh, high concentration are really toxic uh, 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 metabolites. So, based, so these results suggested that indeed stem cell may uh, have a, a role in controlling the stem cell activity. And to demonstrate that this effect on organoid growth was dependent on a specific signaling pathway, um, starting with uh, the activation of TJ5, we decided to repeat the same experiment by using crypts isolated for, from TJ5 knockout mice. And when we, we generate organoids and we treat the organoids with the, uh, bile acids uh, in TJ5 knockout mice, in which the cells are not able to respond to, to bile acid, we completely lost the positive effect effect of bile acid on organoid growth, thus suggesting that uh, TG5 activation is, in, is required for the effect of TG5 on, on this uh, phenotype. Uh, but then we wanted to demonstrate that, uh, that this uh, effect, this positive effect on organoid growth was dependent on activation of TG5 specifically in the stem cells of the, of the intestine. And to do this, we used a, 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 a mouse, um, a reporter mouse called LGR5 CreGFP. And this is a very nice tool because in this mouse, in the crib, the stem cells are marked with GFP. And so you can easily isolate these cells by, uh, by simply fact sorting them. And if you put these cells uh, in culture uh, to form organoids, you see that in a few days, they generate organoids and the, the Alger, the GFP uh, uh, remains localized into the crypts, which is the, 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 the region where the, the stem cells are. Uh, are. Uh, uh, and so we isolate the stem cells and the differentiated cells, and we uh, monitor the expression of this um, uh, uh, receptor for bile acids. And as you can see here, we found that uh, in, the, in the intestinal stem cells, TGR5 is expressed, and it is, is, it's even enriched uh, compared to the differential cells. Uh, so this result proved that stem cells of the intestine are able to, uh, to sense and to respond to the uh, increased level of bile acids. And therefore, we wanted to perform the, uh, uh, the experiment uh, uh, to demonstrate that uh, indeed TGR5 expression in the stem cells is required for the uh, uh, for their homeostasis and for the intestinal homeostasis. And to do this, we generated a new transgenic mouse uh, in which um, uh, we crossed the uh, alger 5 reporter mouse with the TGR5 flux mouse. And we uh, generated a mouse uh, uh, in which after tamoxifen injection, we were able to specifically delete TGR5 only in the stem cells. Uh, and this is because the the, uh, the Creely combinase here is under the control of LGR5, uh, which is the marker of stem cells. So the Creely will be expressed only in the stem cells. And so we again, we isolate the, 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 the GFP positive cells, and we confirmed that in these cells, TGR5 was uh, completely deleted. But we were surprised when we observed the effect, the, the, the physiological effect of TGR5 division these cells by quantifying the, the total number of stem cells in the entire, in the whole intestine. Uh, as you can see here from the quantification of GFP positive cells, we observed that, that after TJ5 deletion, um, there was a strong reduction in the number of stem cells in the, in the gut. And this was co uh, confirmed by immunofluorescence. Uh, 
uh, you see here. In the wild type condition, there are two creeps with many uh, stem cells at the bottom. Uh, instead, in the TGFM account mice, we, we found many uh, creeps that were depleted uh, uh, of uh, stem cells. So these results uh, need suggested that, uh, that uh, TGF5 uh, activation by bilacid is required for the maintenance of the pool of uh, stem cells in, 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 in vivo. And, uh, and this was also associated with a reduction of proliferation of the stem cells. And it's a typical, again, it's a typical uh, readout for stem cell uh, activation. Uh, but then we wanted to, uh, to uh, verify whether our uh, um, result uh, at any uh, physiological uh, and uh, relevance. And to do this, we decide to mean uh, the food ingestion by injecting mice with CCK, which is uh, an hormone cholecystokinin. Uh, uh, and this is in charge for uh, inducing uh, gall blood contraction after food intake, and, and so the release of bilas into the lumen. And by doing this, we were able to mimic the food ingestion and to uh, um, avoid to use um, uh, uh, these nutrients that can be could um, uh, result in many confounding factors. Uh, so by injecting CCK, we are mimicking the effect of food on gallbladder. And as you can see here, after 30 minutes from CCK injection, the gallbladder was completely empty, and so the, the whole uh, bile acid were uh, uh, secreted into the, the, the intestinal lumen, uh, in the, into the duodenum, and when we monitored the proliferation of stem cells after two hours, we found uh, a, a small but significant effect in inducing of, of CCK in, in increasing the proliferation of the, the stem cells, and this was totally lost in TGF final cut mice. So this result uh, really uh, suggests that the, 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 uh, the food intake can indirectly control uh, and dictate the rhythms of uh, intestinal proliferation and regeneration, and so suggests our idea is that uh, by that Acid and food intake. Uh, every time we eat, we are indirectly uh, uh, stimulating the, the uh, daily regeneration of the of the intestine through uh, by uh, by acids. And we also wanted to test the impact of TGF five deletion on uh, uh, re uh, regeneration after a damage, and to do this, we use a, a model of uh, intestinal colitis uh, of colon. Uh, colitis uh, uh, using the DSS protocol. As you can see here, also in this case, the TGR5 knockout mice were less able to regenerate. Uh, and, and you can also uh, see this um, effect on, in these pictures. Uh, you see in the wild type many uh, regenerative crypts. Uh, and instead, in the knockout mice, uh, we found many uh, big regions of illustrations uh, without, uh, without epithelium, basically. Um, then in the last step, we wanted to uh, try to understand the, the mechanism by which the bile acid and TGR5 activation may control int intestinal uh, regeneration. And to do this, we isolate again the, the stem cell from the reporter mouse. We put the stem cells in culture, in, in metrigel, and we immediately treated this with DMSO or with uh, INT777, uh, which is um, uh, a synthetic uh, agonist of TGR5 is a bile acid uh, mimetic, and uh, and then we perform RNA seq, and we found different downregulated and upregulated genes, and we were quite surprised to find that among in the promoter, uh, the, pro the the promoter of the uh, top uh, upregulated genes were enriched for binding site, binding site for the T transcription factors. And this qu was quite interesting because the, the, the transcription factors T are the nuclear mediators of the HIPPO pathway. And the HIPPO pathway is the universal uh, size controller, is a, a, a pathway that is conserved from the sophia to mammals. And as you can see here, it controls the, 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 the proper organ uh, growth, the proper organ sites. Uh, the regulation of the, the HIPPO pathway, such as is in this figure, results in, uh, uh, in uncontrolled growth of, uh, of organs. And, uh, and this is the and on the, the, the activity of the, of the transcription factor TIDs. And these transcription factors are con directly controlled by these two important proteins called YAP and TAP. 
cells that are nuclear cofactors. And basically the, 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 uh, the complex YAPTID uh, acts as a cellular rheostat that uh, it receives and integrates uh, different kinds of signals coming from, for example, hormones, uh, uh, nutritional cues, uh, mechanical signals, and also cell polarity. And, but, and so Yapentid integrates these signals and um, coordinates uh, a biological response that uh, impacts on uh, proliferation stemness, organ size, and cancer. And so we, we uh, hypothesize that indeed the, the effect of uh, uh, bile acid on uh, intestinal regeneration could be mediated by, uh, indeed by YAP. And uh, the, this hypothesis was reinforced by the evidence that YAP is a key element in the reprogramming the algae stem, positive stem cells uh, to drive intestinal regeneration. So we decided to, to, to monitor YAP activation in organoids. And as you can see here, we isolate the stem cells and we put them in culture, in metrigel. And as you can see, YAP uh, uh, was localized in the nucleus and active at day one, at day two, but then uh, it, it disappeared from the, from the nucleus at day three. This was expected and already demonstrated. YAP is important in the first days of, of, of uh, organoid growth. Uh, but when we, we perform the same experiment by treating um, organoids with uh, stem cells with the uh, INT777 with the TGF of agonist, we observed that at day three, YAP was maintained into the uh, nucleus of the organ. And when we looked at this stage of the, um, uh, at the mRNA expression, we found upregulation of the YAP target genes and also upregulation of uh, markers of you know, the fetal intestine that are known to control, uh, uh, to, to control intestinal regeneration. And to, uh, so that is suggesting that indeed TGR5 activation is able to amplify the, uh, the nuclear uh, activity of YAP in, in the organoids. And to make a long story short, we also found that TGR5 activation is able to, active, to induce activation of the kinase SARC, which is a very important upstream regulator of YAP. So SARC phosphorylates YAP in a in a, a tyrosine, uh, which is required for uh, YAP nuclear uh, activation. And we found that, again, that TGF5 activation uh, potentiates this, uh, this uh, phosphorylation. And so we unveiled the existence of this uh, novel axis, uh, in which TGF5 activated by bile acid is able to activate SARC, which uh, uh, in turn activate uh, YAP and uh, to drive regeneration. And so to, to sum up the first part of this seminar, uh, our result, uh, the result of this project uh, provide a proof of principle that the nutritional status of an organism can have an impact on the uh, uh, stem cell function, at least in the intestine. And also we found that physiological release or by of bile acids after food intake is an intrinsic stimulus that dictates the rhythms of uh, intestinal regeneration. And finally, we propose that uh, uh, synthetic agonists that uh, specifically activate TGR5 could be used uh, in uh, regenerative therapies for the uh, for patients with uh, IBD or uh, with inflammatory intestinal diseases. But in parallel uh, 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 to this project, we also uh, 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 studied the, the physiology of uh, the stem, adult stem cells uh, from another tissue, uh, and these are the uh, liver stem cells. As I told you before, uh, the, the liver parenchyma is uh, composed by two main cell types, the hepatocyte that are the metabolic cells and the, the cholangiocyte that is the make the, um, the bile ducts. And in the region between the bile ducts and the hepatocyte called uh, canal of herring, uh, you can find the, these small cells called liver stem cells or also oval cells or bipotent stem cells. They have different names, but essentially they are able to, uh, to suffer new and also to differentiate in, into these two type of cells. That's why they are called bipotent stem cells. And uh, these stem cells are um, uh, extremely important during uh, 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 chronic liver diseases because these stem cells are in charge for uh, liver regeneration during this uh, chronic disease 
diseases when the hepatocytes are not able to, re to regenerate the tissue because they, they, they are uh, damaged. And uh, one of the most important chronic liver disease is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, MAFLD, and it is associated with lifestyle, uh, for example, with diet. It is associated with the three main risk factors, obesity, insulin resistance, and metabolic syndrome. And just to give you a few number, uh, um, NAFLD is a, a real pandemic disease. Uh, between 30 and 40% of people in the US and 10% of uh, children uh, have NAFLD. So we are talking about, about more than 100 million of people only in, uh, in, uh, in US. So it's much worse than cancer. And unfortunately, there are no drugs available uh, in the market to treat this disease, and, uh, and indeed uh, NAFLD is the second uh, leading indication for liver transplantation in the in, in US. And then uh, NAFLD is a progressive disease that starts with steatosis, so accumulation of uh, lipid droplets in the, in the hepatocytes, and this is a quite reversible condition, but it, has also, it, it can also progress to uh, NASH, non-alcoholic steatopatitis, which is characterized by a infiltration of lymphocytes uh, in the parenchyma, and so um, parenchymal uh, inflammation. And, uh, and this uh, condition may uh, progress uh, to the uh, end stage of the disease called cirrhosis, which is instead characterized by fibrosis. And uh, usually a, a cirrhosis leads to liver cancer. And it, May, uh, usually liver cancer uh, arises in the in a context of liver cirrhosis and uh, uh, the only the only therapy a possible therapy for uh, in case of cirrhosis is the liver transplantation and this is a quite efficient therapy uh, this is based on the possibility to uh, to remove a portion of the liver from a healthy donor and to implant this uh, portion in a patient and thanks to the high regenerative potential of this uh, of the liver this will regenerate the, the whole organ in a few weeks and uh, although this is a, a very efficient therapy the waiting list for liver transplantation is increasing over time uh, rapidly and of, and for this reason there is an urgent need for alternative therapies and one of the most most uh, a promising uh, alternative to liver transplantation is represented by the, the liver regeneration, uh, me regenerative medicine. And the, the, uh, the liver regenerative medicine is based on the idea that you can isolate the stem cell from a liver, the one that I showed you before, uh, you, put, you can put these cells in culture, uh, uh, you can expand them as much as you can, and then you you will be able to inject these cells uh, in a patient and eventually these cells will uh, engraft, we, uh, will re uh, re regenerate uh, the, 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 the tissue and reestablish the liver function. And, uh, and this is a um, cartoon that I would like to show you uh, that explains the, the, um, I, the hypothesis behind the, the liver stem cell transplantation therapy. So uh, this is a, a, a fat liver, of course, a diseased liver. This is a, a healthy liver. So you can uh, a, a, isolate a biopsy from a healthy liver. Within the biopsy, you have all the different cells uh, of, the, uh, of the hepatic tissue. So you can uh, easily recognize the uh, sinusoids, the hepatocytes, and the bile ducts. And as I told you before, in the region between the bile ducts and the cholangocyte, there are these, still, um, uh, there are these um, uh, green cells called uh, liver stem cells. And you uh, um, can isolate these cells put them in culture. And if you embed these cells in a in matrix gel, providing the ECM, and if you provide uh, growth factors such as wind agonist and responding and nogging, these cells are able to proliferate and generate these nice cystic organoids uh, called liver organoids. And you can also digest further these uh, organoids uh, to single cells and replate these cells and from each of these uh, uh, stem cells, you will get a new organoid. So you, you can easily amplify uh, um, these uh, cells as much as you want. And once you get the, the, the right 
number of cells you can inject in vivo these cells, uh, the, the stem cells uh, uh, will be able to reach the, um, the parenchyma uh, through the sinusoids. As you know, the, the, the endothelium of the sinusoids is, quite, is uh, highly fenestrated, so the cells can easily move uh, to the parenchyma, and eventually they can repo engraft, repopulate the, the parenchyma, and finally they can uh, differentiate back to cholangiocyte and, uh, uh, and, um, and, and, and hepatocyte, uh, and, and so they can reestablish the, the liver function. So just to convince you that this is not just a dream, uh, but that we are uh, close to the, uh, to the clinical trials, uh, I want to tell you that this, um, this uh, uh, protocol works in, in animals. And also I would like to show you this uh, paper by Ludovic Paller, who works in Cambridge, who recently published this paper in, in, in Science, demonstrating that he, could, he was able that to isolate stem cells from a, a patient. And he put the stem cells in vitro in metrigel with specific growth factor. He got very nice or liver organoids, and then he injected these organoids in, in, in a human liver post-mortem uh, in this uh, perfusion uh, machine. And, uh, and he showed that the cells were able to engraft and also to rescue some liver function. So this is a proof of principle that indeed the cell therapy for the liver works and that it could be uh, this can be tested in clinical trials. However, this protocol cannot be used in clinical trials, and this is because the protocol is based on the use of metrigel. Metrigel is a, a ECM uh, um, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a gel made by ECM proteins, and it has many drawbacks. Uh, for example, the, the chemical composition of the of the metrigel is totally unknown, and and also uh, the mechanical properties of, the, uh, of this gel can, cannot be controlled. And finally, is a tumor-derived matrix. It derives from a, a mouse sarcoma, so it can be dangerous and also immunogenic. So for all this reason, metrigel is not suitable for clinical application. And so we decide to try to solve this problem and generate organoids that, that uh, could be uh, uh, used in real life uh, clinical trials and uh, by uh, using uh, materials uh, that are FDA approved. And to do this, uh, um, I collaborate with Professor Matthias Luthor, who, who is the director of the Institute of Bioengineering of the PFL and who is a um, world-class expert in, uh, in um, uh, materials for culturing stem cells. And uh, Together with Matthias Lutroff, we hypothesized that we could be able to uh, use FDA-approved materials to uh, uh, try to substitute the, the, the metrigel for, uh, for uh, stem cell growth. And for the, to the same, we, de we decided to use uh, polyethylene glycol uh, PEG monomers, which are uh, FDA-approved, and we uh, decided to, to, to design uh, uh, PEG hydrogels and to modify, to functionalize this hydrogel, this PEG hydrogel with adhesive peptides and to encapsulate cells, stem cells in this system. So basically we hypothesized that we could be able to generate a system that, where stem cells are, are encapsulated in, in, in these hydrogels, uh, interact with the, the adhesive peptides and eventually can proliferate and uh, we could expand them. And so to try, um, the system, we isolate stem cells from mouse liver, we embed this, uh, these cells in, in PEG, and then we put the PEG uh, gels in culture. And after three days, we quantified the number of organoids that we were able to, to obtain. Of course, we first uh, um, functionalized the hydrogel with basic peptides, uh, for example, collagen-4, lamin-1, and fibronectin. And we also use RGD which is a small peptide, is a, it's a tripeptide tri that represents the binding sites of integrin on fibronectin. And this is fully synthetic. Uh, this is crucial for uh, clinical translation of the, of, the, of, the, of the gel. So it's not animal derived, but it's uh, totally synthetic. So when we uh, perform the experiment, you, you see that we were able to generate organoids in all the conditions, and in particular, the minimal modification with RGD Gave, 
results that were pretty similar to the ones obtained in uh, the classic map. And uh, we were not only able to generate uh, or organoids, but we also uh, were able to, to passage them weekly uh, and basically to amplify them. And we kept organoids growing in culture for even for months. And uh, at the uh, histological level, the organoids generated uh, in PEG were in this state distinguishable from the one uh, generated in metrigel. So both of them are composed by uh, a central lumen surrounded by a pseudostratified epithelium. And when we looked at the marker of stem cells, such as EPCAM, KLT19, and SOX9, uh, again, there were no clear differences between the organoids in metrigel and in, in, in our system. And this was confirmed also at mRNA level. And uh, we then decide to uh, to uh, um, per, to test whether we, we could be able to uh, culture organoids that uh, could be used uh, in clinical trials in um, uh, in real life. So uh, with humans, so to do this, we collaborate with uh, um, with uh, Marcus Heim in uh, Basel, who is a, a pathologist who will provide us with many biopsies. Uh, from different patients, and we, we were able to isolate the stem cells and put uh, the, the cells in the peg hydrogels. And you can see here that after a few days, we were able to generate organoid lines from each uh, patient. And I, I want to stress the fact that these organoids uh, generated with this protocol and with these materials uh, could be uh, readily, uh, readily used in uh, clinical trials. And we also wanted to test the potential of these stem cells to differentiate back to hepatocytes because uh, at the end of the day, we need uh, functional hepatocytes uh, to, uh, um, uh, in, in, in the liver. And to do this, we induce force the differentiation of these cells into hepatocytes uh, by using a specific medium. And as you can see, all the markers of the, of the stem cell, of the hepatocytes, uh, were increased uh, even a uh, hundred or a thousand times. So this is the cytochrome, the albumin, the glutamine synthetized all the, the markers that, that we tested. And instead the stem cell markers such as Alger 5 disappeared completely, suggesting uh, 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 a strong induction of differentiation. And then uh, we, uh, uh, so with these results, we generate a system to uh, culture and amplify a stem cell that could be potentially used in clinical trials. But then we also wanted to use our hydrogel to try to, uh, to uh, address uh, some biologi basic biological questions that we had in our laboratory. And in particular, we are interested in uh, making mechanical forces coming from the environment and also mechanical transduction. And, uh, uh, and in particular, we are uh, strongly interested in, um, in, uh, in tissue stiffness. Uh, and this is because uh, these mechanical forces, including the, the stiffness of the tissue, have very important roles in the physiology of our tissue. Uh, and for example, um, in our body, we have uh, different tissues with different stiffness. We have very soft tissues, for example, the brain with a stiffness of about 100 pascal, but then we, but then we have uh, stiffer tissues such as the liver with a stiffness of one kilopascal. Uh, and finally, we have very stiff uh, tissues such as the, the bone, uh, about one gigapascal. And the maintenance of the, the physiological stiffness is uh, important because alterations in the in uh, ECM stiffness and mechanics are associated with pathological uh, disease such as cardiovascular diseases and, and, and uh, for example, cancer. Uh, and on the other side, the maintenance of the, phys the, 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 the physiological stiffness uh, is important for, uh, uh, for the physiology of our tissues because they control the uh, important processes such as differentiation of wound dealing, just as an uh, example. And, um, and I want to bring your attention on the importance of the stiffness in the hepatic tissue. Uh, maybe you don't know, but there is a, a tool called FibroScan in the hospital that can be used, that is able to, um, to predict and to make a diagnosis of liver uh, fibrosis uh, just by measuring the stiffness of the liver. And this is because during fibrosis, the stiffness of this tissue uh, increases aberrantly. Uh, this is just an effect of uh, accumulation of collagen and scar tissue, which reduces the elasticity of the, of the tissue and increase the, increases the, 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 the stiffness. 
And uh, uh, however, the, despite that this effect is, is so clear that is is used as a diagnostic tool, nobody knows uh, whether there is an effect uh, of this aberrant stiffness on the physical physiology and the behavior of the liver, uh, the liver cells, and in particular of the liver stem cells. And uh, we hypothesize that, of course, uh, trying to uh, address um, this question in vivo would be impossible because you cannot control the, the stiffness in vivo as a single parameter. But we reasoned that we could use our hydrogel uh, to address this question because we can easily tune uh, uh, the stiffness uh, of, uh, of our hydrogels to the levels of normal and fibrotic tissues. And so to, uh, to address this question, so to understand whether the aberrant stiffness has an impact on, on the liver stem cell physiology, we went back to literature, uh, this atomic force microscopy analysis, and we found that the, the stiffness of a normal mouse liver is about one, two kilopascal. And so we generate hydrogels at different stiffness from uh, very low uh, values, uh, let's say the, 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 the stiffness of a brain until reaching the normal liver stiffness. And when we encapsulate the stem cell in these hydrogels at different stiffness, then we uh, um, uh, monitor the organic growth, we found that a very low stiffness, the stiffness of the brain, stem cells of the liver are not able to grow, but then we reached a, 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 a growth uh, plateau when we match the, the, the stiffness of the, the normal real stiffness. Um, and uh, so this result suggests that indeed recapitulating the, the, the mechanical environment in vitro is critical for, for uh, growing organoids. And, um, and also I suggest uh, that it's in this stem cells are able to sense the mechanical environment and to act in response to this uh, stimuli. And, um, uh, and this effect was dependent on proliferation as you can see from the, the EDU experiment. But then we, we, we also observed data coming from a, a mouse with a liver fibrosis and we found that that high fibrosis corresponds high stiffness of about uh, four kilopascal. Therefore, we generate fibro fibrosis-like hydrogels. And when we encapsulate the stem cells, we found that in this condition, stem cells were much less able to, to, to grow, uh, demonstrating that indeed, uh, again, the, the stem cells are able to, to sense the, 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 the changes and the, uh, the phys physiological and unphysiological env mechanical environment, and they can respond to these uh, inputs. And we also found that the, the change, just changing the mechanical properties of the gel, it was enough to activate a, a stress response, the typical liver uh, uh, stress response uh, called acute phase response. And this was just uh, induced by simply changing the, 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 the mechanical pa parameters. And uh, so to, to sum up uh, this uh, second part, we were not only able to generate liver uh, uh, organoids uh, using only FDA approved uh, materials that could be used for, uh, for um, uh, clinical trials, but we also uh, uh, unveiled the existence uh, of, uh, um, of mechanical signals that control uh, stem cell uh, fitness and, uh, and that the aberrant uh, mechanical environment during, established during fibrosis uh, is detrimental for stem cell uh, expansion. And so maybe this data can explain why during fibrosis the stem cells are not able to efficiently regenerate the, 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 the liver. So probably part of this problem is... Uh, a mechanical problem. And this was the last slide. I just want to thank Professor Christina Skunians and Professor Matthias Lutov for their support on these two projects. And of course, I, I, I want to uh, thank Professor Giannino de Sal for the constant support on my research from, from him. And thank you. <laughs>